Big thank you to Vanessa and the Research Centre for inviting me to speak about some of the aspects of writing my opera, Dry River Run. And uh, it's actually been a really good chance for me personally to reminisce about the process, which sort of, sort of finished last October, but I just wrote an extra interlude for it last weekend, so it, it's ongoing. Um, what do you do the day you start writing an opera? Um, the day had been a fair while coming, and I started the actual process in September 2016, during the term break uh, from the con, and I was spending time with my partner Trish in Coffs Harbour at the time, which is something I did about every second weekend and almost every holidays. For some reason, the kitchen table in that house in Coffs Harbour seemed to be the only place I could write for the next 15 months, almost entirely at the exclusion of anywhere else. Most of the other pieces I'd written in recent years have been written on aircraft. Um, I sat there surrounded by an electronic piano, scores of Yanufa and George Benjamin's Written on Skin, my most valuable book, Behind Bars, by Elaine Gould, the composer's Bible, and of course, Walter Piston's book on orchestration. And I stood at the standing desk, almost oblivious to the rest of the world for the whole time. Um, of course, except when Trish was cooking about three metres from me. And in honest truth, the real inspiration for this opera was her amazing cooking and her practising the Walton Cello Concerto. Of course, the planning for writing an opera, or in this case, Dry River Run, goes back a bit further than that, uh, to the end of 2014. I had accepted the position here at QCGU, and as part of my position, uh, I was asked to write an opera for the opera school here for 2018. And when Professor Harrison slipped the idea into my contract negotiations, I arrogantly, arrogantly thought, yeah, I can do that. To be honest, the longest piece I'd written at that stage was about 23 minutes, and I thought that was too long. Um, the audience did too, unfortunately. <laughs> so where do you start when you're confronted with writing a two-hour opera? Every piece I'd written before, uh, before this had started with the spark of an opening sound. Um, this didn't work like that. You have to have words and a story that opens the door and to the drama of your musical palette. I retreated to Melbourne, back to my job at the Australian National Academy, and I looked out the window at another gloomy day in Melbourne, really wishing I was still in Brisbane, and I just tried to think it through. What the hell did I say I would do? And more importantly, what did I say I could do? Out of the panic came a plan, and there was one person I knew who could help, and that was Rodney Hall. Rodney and I had worked together on several projects, um, but most importantly, uh, he was a long-standing mate of my father's. In 1957, Rodney and my father were members of the Brisbane Bushwalkers Association, and in July that year, they were part of the first busload of tourists ever to dare, the cross, uh, dare to cross the unsealed roads from Brisbane to Uluru a trip that none of us will ever be able to replicate, how beautiful it must have been. No tourists, no hotels, and almost no sign of the environment being damaged by white man. Rodney, of course, went on to become one of our great, greatest writers. He won the Miles Franklin Award twice. And in 1971 and 72, he helped design the Australia Council for the Arts. Don't mention that to Rodney. He'll talk about how that design lasted about 25 minutes. We became friends much later, and I had to say there was no one else in the world that I, I knew that knew more about music than Rodney, or certainly had stronger opinions about music than Rodney. His love of Berlioz, and the, in particular the Haydn creation, stuck in my mind incredibly strongly. His poetry sang, and his prose words have a real lilt. I rang him with great enthusiasm, and just a little bit of fear that he might say no. We sat in a cafe in South Melbourne. What else is there in South Melbourne, let's face it? And I asked him to write me a story and a libretto for an opera that I'd been asked to write. His eyes lit up at the very mention of it. He didn't like my idea for a story. My, originally, my original storyline was basically an opera version of the Sevex refugee boat that sank off Western Australia in 2001 with the loss of 356 lives. A story that already inspired two of my pieces. Instead, we talked about Barbara Bainton and Henry Lawson and our great painters Drysdale, Streeton and McCubbin. 
And we decided at that meeting that it was going to be something very Australian, imbued with the very spirit of pre-Federation Australia. He left with a CD of my music and I left with an excited and somewhat calmer mindset. At our next meeting about a month later, he showed me the story which was then five scenes. I'm sure the singers would have been delighted not to have to sing scene eight. It was completely laid out with characters and storyline and throughout 2015 we met regularly and every time we met he would excitedly show me the latest developments. Until December 2015, the day before I officially left Melbourne, we sat together in Rodney's flat in Pran and read the completed libretto together over a bottle of champagne. Settling back in Brisbane in January 2016, I still had three pieces to write before the opera could be started, but my head was definitely in the process of how do I write music to give justice to this 70 to 80 pages of libretto. I'd set about a dozen poems in my life as a composer, but this was something else entirely. However, most importantly, one thing was troubling me. I just didn't get the end of the opera. I didn't feel it was right and I was uncomfortable with the two-page aria for Mrs Calloway played by Xenia here in about six weeks. I couldn't hear the end and I, most, most importantly for me, I couldn't see it. A big part of the way I write music is to imagine sitting in a hall or a theatre and I can see the people I'm writing for playing the piece that I haven't yet written. When I read the end of Rodney's libretto, I, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't see it and I didn't felt it justified the immense drama that had preceded it. I sat with Stephen and his wife Nancy and Trish around our dining table and read the libretto twice, beginning to end. We all agreed that the end was not where we expected it to go or even wanted it to go. We discussed this for hours and I'm very grateful to all of them for the care that they generously gave to help me get it right. Many conversations with Rodney later, let's just leave it at that. The end went through several refinements until we got it to the point we have it now. By then I had already written the first act and most have seen five, so it was starting to get a little tight. <coughs> I quite often sit and contemplate my personal process of writing and composition, and indeed the anyone, anyone sitting and writing music, poetry, a novel, or painting a picture. More so during this time, of course, should there be a plan? And, or does the music actually dictate the path itself? My friend and fellow composer Martin Bresnik, who's the husband of wonderful Australian pianist Lisa Moore, talks about not leaving home until all the bags are packed. And my composition teacher at Melbourne Uni, Stuart Greenbaum, whom I studied with in 2012 to 2015 while I did my masters there, really ran this home to me. But I, I never, ever achieved it. And I actually believed I couldn't achieve it. The eight chords, which I'll talk about in a minute, that I ended up writing on day one were the closest thing I've ever had to having a plan or having my bags packed. During one of my many conversations with Rodney, I asked him about what his process in writing a novel is. And he talked about starting with characters in a scene or a setting and letting the characters go, in a sense, live and see what happens. Uh, what they do seemingly naturally, what, what they do but also what they say. In many ways, this pretty well sums up my compositional process. Most of my best laid plans for any piece ne never vaguely resemble the final utterance. The music takes on a life of its own and usually goes in totally different directions to where I thought it would go. Having a libretto is perhaps the best and most important plan that an opera needs and my task and challenge in this case was to discover the sound for each character and each particular drama. This was sometimes very easy and sometimes extremely difficult. One thing that occupies my composer's mind more than anything else is where is music at the moment in a global perspective? What are people writing and what are people listening to? How much of what we listen to these days is dictated by radio programs or marketing directors for symphony orchestras or opera companies? And how much do we individually seek out new composers, new pieces? I particularly love it when one of my students comes to me and says, hey, you've got to listen to this and it's a piece I've never heard. I'll never forget my wonderful conservatorium lecturer and composition teacher, John Gilfeder, proudly playing our fourth year class, a recording of John Adams' Harmonium and saying very definitively, this, as it turns out, is where music is now. 
make no mistake, music was absolutely everything to me and I, I loved everything about all eras of music, particularly 20th century music and its history. I was fascinated by the meeting of great composers like Stravinsky's friendship with Debussy or Gershwin's trip to Europe where he met Ravel, Stravinsky and Berg and how that influenced Porgy and Bess. So I sat there in John's class and did a quick, quick, complete recap of the 20th century, the second Viennese school, Stravinsky and Bartok, through to the composers still alive at that time, Ligeti, Messi and Tippett and Budoslowski. So when John Gilfeder, my guru, started, stated that music made it to and added up to John Adams' harmonium, a great crack in the world, in my world, appeared for the very first time. Was it really the case that this tonal minimalism, as much as I admired it, was where we were at, at the end of the explosive century of creativity? I wasn't composing much at that time, but I did start to question, if I did, where would my music fit? And did it have to fit? Most importantly, was there anything new to say? I adore John Adams' music, particularly Harmony Lehrer. But for my guru to suggest that that's where music was did cause me great concern. Being a composer today allows enormous freedom of style and language, of course, but tastes change so quickly and we are governed very much by what our arts organisations are prepared to program or at least attempt to try and promote. If somebody asked me where music was in 1987, I would have just said it's everywhere, absolutely everywhere, and that's a great thing. Music is about all sorts of emotions and all sorts of things. It tells all sorts of stories. I hate to accept a time where it's okay or the norm for us to listen again and again to the constant retelling of the same old stories, as great as many of them are, at the expense of something new and thought-provoking. As con students, Graham Jennings and I would sit with bottles of beer for hours listening to Ligeti and Ludoslowski and speaking in hushed spiritual tones of the marvel of it all. Having Ludoslowski, of course, in the conservatorium building in 1987 was one of the most special moments of my musical life. It became very obvious to me early on that the music I liked to listen to and felt drawn to was highly charged, passionate, confronting and often very sad music. Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony, Salome, Tristan, Mahler Kinder Totenlieder, Rachmaninoff's Isle of the Dead, Shostakovich's 14th Symphony, not one of the most cheerful pieces ever written, Death and the Maiden, The Earl King, Beethoven's Slow Movements, The Ligeti Chamber Concerto, the list goes on. But in this case, the operas that were relevant to me and this discussion were Shostakovich's Lady Macbeth, Poulenc's Dialogue of the Carmelites, Puccini, Tosca, Janacek, Yanufa, and Mozart, Don Giovanni. That gives you a little key to the door as to why I write the music I do. I know I can't write any music approaching the genius of Brahms in that amazing language of his, so I, I was and I am determined to develop my own language in fingerprints and sound. My music, I hope, is really only concerned with the pursuit of drama and the extremes inherent in the world of drama, as soft as possible and as loud as possible. And although occasionally I use mezzo piano as a means of describing a second or third voice, the very nature of using mezzo piano irritates the hell out of me. To me, getting a reaction or an emotive response from the listener has to be the goal, and after all, isn't that what music is all about? I firmly believe that emotion and passion must always and actually really has to be at the very heart of music, particularly any music that I attempt to write. And Rodney has given me a story and a libretto of intensity and confronting issues and real life drama. The challenge for me is and was to ensure that the music emphasised and portrayed the drama and didn't stifle it or divert from it. I have no idea at this stage if I've achieved this, but I'll let you know in the middle of September. Actually, to be more truthful, you'll probably tell me. When I finally got to September 2016, I had spent the entire year filling my head with opera. All my drives to Coffs Harbour were about studying and discovering this incredible world. De Freischutz, Janufa, Martinu's operas, Walton's great opera, Troilus and Cressida, Britain's Grimes, of course, Shostakovich's Lady Macbeth, but the new ones on the scene, George Benjamin's Written on Skin, Thomas Artis' The Tempest and My Brother's Bliss. 
And of course, Stephen's sitting here, so it wouldn't do me any good not to mention the fact that I listen to Parsifal quite a lot, uh, along with Salome, Fidelio, Marriage, Flute and Giovanni. On day one, Trish left for work and I sat there staring at the libretto. I had just one chord in my mind at that stage, one chord for two and a half hours of music. I loved the symmetry of it first and then the sound. I don't play the piano well, but that's where all my music starts. If I can at least attempt to read bass clef, this is what the chord was. <laughs> F, A sharp, F sharp, B. And it's got so much, so much about that chord that I stumble across that I like because it's got two minor ninths, but it's anchored by the surrounding fourths. I found that chord really questioned my ear and led me on to see what was further in the series. On hearing that chord, stumbling by a chance, I felt that the sound of it drew me in. And I wanted to see where that drawing went. The next thing I did was compose the subsequent series of chords, eight in total, and they became known as the Callaway chords after the main character of the opera, Reverend Fred Calloway. These chords are the very first notes that hit uh, the notebook that first day and became the basis for almost everything from that moment on. I'm going to ask you to play those eight chords, Stephen. I don't use traditional harmony. I guess you just worked that out. Well, not intentionally anyway. I like the power of octaves, particularly down low, but I go a long way to avoid thirds of any kind. I love them, but I always, uh, they've been so well used by the masters, I feel a total fraud using them. I like consecutive fourths and fifths because it would annoy the hell out of my Amy B teacher. <laughs> And there is one D major chord in C eight. Don't worry, if you come to the opera, you'll hear it. It's reference to that moment in Schoenberg's Transfigured Night. And without revealing the intricacies of the story, many of you will understand why I chose that chord when you hear it. Funnily enough, the other day in rehearsal when Jill played the chord, Xenia went, oh, what a beautiful chord. <laughs> um, I had to apologise and take absolutely no credit for it. Uh, by lunch on day one, I had the eight chords. I felt that was a fairly good start. I was exhausted. And I started to feel the drama inherent in those chords, so I decided to start writing the opera in the middle. And I wanted to see if they were capable of giving me what I needed them to give me. The first text I set was Reverend Calloway's big scene, which is scene five. This is the turmoil-laden scene where he questions his desires, his family motives, his life's work, his very existence, perhaps most importantly, his inner sinister narcissism by the end of his wrangling with himself. He decides on the path of darkness. This scene took me about two weeks. I can't actually remember ever moving from the laptop at all in that time. Trish would leave for work and the next minute it seemed she was coming back through the door and it was almost dark. I sent the MP3 off to, of the Sibelius version to Rodney, Stephen and Scott after having listened to it and debated it with Trish about a million times and then the opera was born. The daunting thing to, was a realisation that it was less than a tenth of the libretto. I realised at that moment that writing opera was about incredible patience and the ability to play the long game. 
drawing out the drama, cre creating contrasts on an enormous canvas, a canvas that I had never approached ever before. I'd certainly never experienced it because all of the instrumental pieces that I'd written lasted as exla exactly as long as I thought they needed to. The beginning of the story had always troubled me because of the way it incorporates the hymn, Oh God, Our Help in Ages Past. At the start of the opera, we, brought, we are brought into the drama by the funeral of Archie Calloway, who was Reverend Calloway's brother, and he was the husband of Mrs Calloway and the father of Veronica. I couldn't hear this at all at first, or at second. I always had trouble with music that incorporates well-known tunes. John Carigliano managed this very successfully in his Three Hallucinations, where he composed, when he composed music for the film Altered States. He used the song Rock of Ages in the most creepy way. I'd always stored this one in the back of my mind, knowing that it might be useful res res uh, reference point at some time. Rodney is a firm believer in the audience understanding why the characters on the stage sing in opera and not just talk or speak as in a play. And the hymn for Rodney was his way of bringing the audience into this world of disbelief. The hymn ultimately provided me a number of moments throughout the opera, particularly underneath the storm scene. And at the very end, uh, the total smearing of the harmony in scene eight and at various different other moments, smaller moments throughout the entire opera. But in all honesty, the hymn was much easier to hear once I'd established the two most important elements of the original sound, and that was the flies and the butcher birds. Can't get much more Australian than that. But in all honesty, um, well, Rodney states in the, the opening, the funeral procession is coming from afar with the congregation singing the hymn, surrounded and accompanied by hordes of pestilential flies and the song of butcher birds. Trish showed me what was possible on the cello and the fly sound was born. And of course, it has to be on the viola. Where else? I had so much pleasure telling my brother that the opera started with a viola solo, <laughs> imitating flies. And then the butcher birds. Originally I'd intended to just use recording of butcher birds but I notated some of the songs of the birds around our house in St Lucia and a couple of the recordings on YouTube and I gave them to the winds to have fun with while, and we were away. I'm going to play you the opening three and a half, four minutes of the opera, which is from um, the orchestral suite that I made for the QSO, which they played uh, last August. The, this, will this will show you the flies, the birds and the use of the hymn, I hope.
the hymn, the eight Callaway chords, the previously unmentioned six Mrs. Callaway chords, the woodblock for the two boys, Henry and Joseph, the flies, the birds, and a tone row in, in homage of Schoenberg, which has 13 notes just to really annoy him, all added up to provide the majority of the harmonic language for the entire 140 minutes of music that is Dry River Run. So instead of packing my bags before I left, I seemed to gather bits and pieces as I travelled the length of the libretto. I reckon the bags were as full as I needed them to be by the time I got to the end of scene eight. I'm just going to play you one more example before I ask Stephen to join me to ask me some probing questions. Um, I just wanted to give you a, an example. That wasn't including the, the eight Callaway chords. I just wanted to give you an example of the eight Callaway chords. students taking part of that and Peter. Um, I'd like to welcome Professor Stephen Emerson who's going to, um, and Stephen has been along with Trish one of my great sounding boards for the whole process of writing this opera and he's going to ask me some questions about it and ask me some things that I haven't talked about hopefully or maybe, maybe hopefully not. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about Parsifal. <laughs> <laughs> we could listen Thank to you, it. Paul. Thank could you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. That was fabulous. I mean, that is, you gave us such an insight into so much that lies behind this, this production and the, and the scale in which it unfolded over time. Really, really interesting. Um, of course, even just hearing that, that last bit where you say this is the eight chords, and I just played the eight chords, and I saw them, and I heard them, but I couldn't hear them in that. Is, is, is something about this things that you'd be aware of in terms of process that may not be audible to oh, I audience? certainly hope so. <laughs> I really hope so. Um, the, the chords, it's, it's not a case of that they, um, 
they appear as, as solitary things. It's for, they're forever. I mean, there was one, there's one page of that orchestral score where seven of the chords happen, but they're all on top of each other at various different moments. You, I can hear them because, of course, I, I put them there, but um, they sort of... It, at that part of the opera, it's absolutely horrific mm -hmm. what's, what the, that, that man is not only going through, but what he's about to do. And, and I use those chords as a means to, to show this, this turmoil, this, this mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolute mm -hmm. tearing, of, uh, tearing of himself apart. Yes. So, so, so it's, always it goes beyond the technical thing that's involved to yeah. the impression that yeah. you're wanting. Just yeah. reminded of a, quite a heard of Mahler saying talk about the process of composition. Someone asked him to discuss process of composition, and he said, well, it's a bit like... Um, making a trumpet. You know how you make a trumpet? You, you get a hole and then you wrap a little bit of tin around it. And that's about what it is with composition. You know, the, the bit of tin around it is this excuse for actually the real thing is this yeah. intangible something that... Yeah. Well, the thing about the eight chords or the hymn or the, the, the flies or, or anything that's a part of the opera, it, it gave me it gave me boundaries mm -hmm. and it gave me a sense of, I mean, with two and a bit hours music, I could have gone literally anywhere and it would have driven me insane. And, and those moments that I did write 40, 50, 100 bars that I just went, delete, there would have been so much more of that. The, the chords and Mrs. Calloway's chords and, and the, the rhythm that accompanies the two boys were all about keeping me focused on the actual process of writing. It's a bit, for me, it's a bit like veganism. You know, I can't go downstairs and just buy a chocolate. Because if I could, I would. But I can't, so I don't. Yes, that's the difficulty of limits, too. Yeah, it's, it, the, the eight chords were, were my version of musical veganism, basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I must say, just from, from the, 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 on the sidelines here, we're, we're observing this process. I know you said you had a couple of weeks over that initial scene, but my impression was that a lot of this came out with quite remarkable fluency. I mean, I, I would uh, get these emails from Paul and he would say, uh, wrote scene X over the weekend. And when he wrote it, he wrote it in full score. There must have been, uh, I mean, there, there must have been all sorts of um, fluency and sort of creative juices flowing at different stages? Oh, I think it was a combination of that, uh, of that and also panic. I've got to get this done. <laughs> um, I think, uh, you know, that th those moments where you are just under the pump and thinking, I've got another 70 pages of libretto. It was, it was fear as well as the fact that, of course, the story. And once, once I had the sound for each character or the sound for each scene, it actually happened quickly. Mm -hmm. And I, I write in full score. I, I take, I've got several notebooks of manuscript that have all the, the notes and all of that stuff. But I go straight to the full score mm -hmm. because I have to hear it in an orchestral sense. Mm -hmm. I, I, have to, I have to hear the, the voices and how they're going to play with the orchestra in a sense. And of course the, the, the job of making the vocal score was absolutely horrific for Kevin Power who was very gracious and very pain, uh, patient in, in making what is about 350 pages of vocal score out of my, my orchestral nonsense. How many pages of full score do you remember? Uh, it's about 400, Nick, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's lots, it's lots. Anyway, so it's a bit like the, the undergraduate student with a history essay due tomorrow. There was a bit of that. <laughs> um, I've always, I, I, but, I, I think the key was, was, you know, what Bresnik talks about, packing the bags. Mm -hmm. Whilst I didn't necessarily have all of the, the tools and the harmonies and everything when I started, I gathered them along the way and they in, in themselves provided the inspiration. And, and I did avoid some scenes because I just, I, I couldn't hear them. Like, I couldn't hear them and I couldn't see them. And eventually when I sat down, there may be two or three or four weeks where I just sort of stared into space or didn't write anything, mm -hmm. um, or just wrote some notes or started something and went back. I remember after I'd finished the third scene, uh, it was when my father died, and I came back thinking that I was going to open the fourth scene with 
uh, just this little echo of Mendelssohn's Italian, uh, Scottish Symphony, which was his favourite piece. And I just thought, and it was a bit like the hymn at the beginning, I just, it just was so awful. It was the worst tribute ever to my father. So starting, actually starting writing again after my father passed away was probably the biggest hiatus. Mm -hmm. And also scene four was, was the most difficult for me to, to get into, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. like that. But then of course the, the process of putting the dots on the page actually was far from the end of it. Of course that the, this, the, this opera has been a hugely complex collaborative thing, not just with Rodney, yeah. but also with, with obviously with Nick, with the singers, with the, with the, 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 um, the whole production team around it. Can you say a few words about the challenges involved there? Oh, it, it really came home, I was telling you this yesterday, it came home to me a couple of weeks ago when I changed something in the score and I thought, gee, I better tell Nick about that. And, and when, I, when I put Nick's name in the two column, I thought, well, actually, Jill needs to know too. And the stage, for it, uh, and it ended up being 15 people <laughs> that had to know about this one small, tiny change. And it was, I mean, it, it struck me at that point that an opera is just, you know, in a sense, I've handed this to Nick now and the singers. It's, it's beyond anything that I imagined at the start, but also going to production meetings and hearing about costumes and wigs and how are we going to, what are we going to do about the gunshot? And we have to have an armourer and we have to have somebody who's got a licence to fire a gun and we have to have... The, it's just... It, it, it is... It's, it's beyond... I mean, I can't imagine what... I mean, Wagner was probably better at it by the time we got to the ring cycle, but... Oh, he took decades to build it up. But, but yeah. it's part of what composers have to do beyond, of course, yeah. just... But sit, sitting, sitting in Jill's studio and watching the, 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 the singers learn something that's not diatonically straightforward, lots of minor ninths, major sevenths, augmented fourths, up and down and all over the place, and you're five, eight, three, eight, two, four, and actually, that the weight of that coming down on me and saying these guys have got to, these guys have got to memorise this, and they have. Most of them have got it completely memorised. I remember I was very grateful to Nick Cleavery for saying, because we talked at the very start about how do I write a piece? Do I do I do I have to give allowances for the fact that I'm writing for students? Some, of course, the singers are, are, are wonderful and wonderfully trained, but they're, they're still students and they're not, they're not, and they're not experienced with learning a new opera. It's not like I was writing for Barbara Hannigan or Alan Clayton. I was writing for, you know, um, some, some students here in third and fourth year. And he, he very graciously said, you write the piece that you want to and we'll deal with the issues as they come about later. And I think that, that sort of gave me a sense of freedom and I, I've really, I've let the orchestra have their head at certain times and, and I, I really hope that they enjoy it, but it's certainly going to be a challenge for the orchestral musicians as well. Wonderful not just to write for young people, but I, I think you had in mind some really particular people who would take particular roles or even particular instruments in the orchestra. Was that, that, that a huge part of your that's consideration? Usually, that's usually a, a big part of what I do and as, as I got to know Oliver Boyd's singing because he is the, the, the centre the center part, and he is in all but one scene. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a mammoth learn for him. As I got to know him and his voice, my writing changed, and I went back and changed some later once I got to know his singing, but he's such a, a lovely guy, but when he takes on the persona of Calloway in scene five, I'm terrified by him and I'm sure the audience will be. So, you know, and Xenia, of course, I knew her voice uh, quite well and she's, you know, a superstar in the making. So Mrs. Calloway's aria in scene eight was very much made around her voice. Look, I must say it's whetting our appetites enormously to, to hear this uh, in the near future. We could talk for hours. Um, I just wonder though, given that we've only got about another 10 minutes left, I wonder if any in the audience have any questions you'd like to put to Paul about anything that he said? Yes. Do you associate C major with the character Reverend Calloway? Because there was, I noticed this in rehearsal, um, the hymn starts on C major, and at the end of, I think, scene five, the strings have a big C minor chord that turns into a C major. Is 
intentional? Get out. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is intentional. <laughs> oh, if you think it's intentional, it is. Uh, no, there is, a, there is a relevance between the chords and the hymn that grows throughout the opera. Originally, it was completely separate and completely, but that particular moment. Uh, at the end of the storm, yes, there, there, is a, there is a relevance there of Reverend Calloway representing the church, the hymn representing the church, and of course when you hear, oh, I'm not going to give anything away by saying this, but in the storm, of course, the hymn is in the minor, and you hear, you hear the hymn like uh, in Ives' Unanswered Question, so it's like the Druids playing underneath and there's all this the world is ending in the storm outside, but you'll just hear this, and it's in the minor. Very, very slow, as in, you know, very much inspired by Ives at that point. And then it turns into the major at the end, leading into that next moment that, of course, you, you probably have had a chance to have a look at being in the chorus. But well picked up. <laughs> Any other questions anyone would like to ask? Hi, Tom. Um, I'm curious, how much of the improvisation for you play in composing? How much of the role of the improvisation play? Quite a lot, actually, at the piano. I mean, I don't play the piano, I'm hopeless. But that's how I found all of the chords, and that's how I start every piece, is I just sit in my office here or on the electric piano at the time, and I could play for maybe an hour and a half before I find the chord that I'm looking for. And sometimes, in finding the chord that I'm after, uh, it's sometimes it's a visual thing. You know, one note goes up, one note goes down a semitone or something, and I'll play around with that for ages. So there is a certain degree of uh, that. And the, the bird song, I, I played quite a lot of them on the clarinet, of course, um, and I mucked around a fair bit with that. But um, no, there is. The, in essence, I guess the whole thing is, is about improvisation. Sometimes just using Sibelius as an improvisation tool. Sometimes using the piano, sometimes using the clarinet. Sometimes just going for a walk on the beach is enough of an improvisation, if you know what I mean. So can I just ask for that question just quickly? So how much of the score that gets in your head before you write that? Oh, a sound, the sound is? and what I, where I want it to go is, but how I get there is, is pretty much wrought out of, in a sense, I guess I'm, I'm carving something out of a stone, like a sculpture in a way. It's not, I know where it needs to go, I know what it needs to sound like, and I have a, I did a storyboard at one point early on, and I had a, had a sort of, some sort of oral vision of where I wanted every scene to go, but of course that, that changes with every, every moment and stuff. So, no, it's, it's, it's not exactly as I intended, but I knew what I wanted it to sound like. And how I got there is usually sometimes it, it was 15 or 16 different tries before it got to that point. But after a bit of mucking around, we got there. Yeah. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Um, I'm sure this will make us all wait with eager anticipation to see and hear this such an exciting event in Australian music. Always in your opera is an exciting event, but to create one with young people with an institution such as this is a miraculously thrilling thing to happen. Congratulations to you, to the con and to everyone for making this happen. We shall see you all in the first week of September. First week of September. First week of September. Uh, please thank Paul. Thank you. <laughs>